afternoon to everybody and uh, today we continue with uh, the series as Geetika just mentioned on uh, key texts both in humanities as well as in literature so, and social sciences. A uh, uh, couple of points I want to reiterate uh, when we started this series that the texts which we will be choosing will be both from social sciences like political science, history, sociology uh, and also from humanities, literature, philosophy. Uh, we also made the point that we will be taking key texts which are from uh, Indian context, South Asian context as well as global context. Uh, many of the global contexts are western because that is the legacy of history but we will make an effort also to look into texts from other non-western countries other than India. The third point that I wanted uh, to emphasize when we do these discussions that there would be some thematic continuities that though the text may be very very different for example the text that we did on Hind Swaraj, the text that we did on Rokia's uh, you know uh, Sultana's dream, uh, the text that we did in sociological imagination they may be very very different. But what is common to all of them is that they provide insights in understanding the social, the societies within which we live, what is common, what is different what and what should be the analytical lenses through which we should understand the institutions and the ideas within which we as individuals and as groups live in society. It is in this context that we look at Anthony Giddens one of the probably best known contemporary British sociologists and we take up not any textbooks or any books as such but we take up an article and the article is called Institutional Reflexivity and Modernity. This is the other point which I forgot to mention that apart from western, non-western, diverse discipline we will also take up not just books but perhaps important essays, important articles. But we will stick to the text because that is one of the intent to see how do these scholars write and why it is important to go through these texts. Giddens like the others that we have covered also looks at modernity. In fact most of the texts that we will be dealing with would be engaging with different dimensions of modernity. The dimension that Giddens is looking at here is reflexivity, in particular institutional reflexivity and as we move forward we will be able to get a sense of what exactly is it that he means by reflexivity. The first point that he mentions that reflexivity is not specific or unique to modernity, it is a characteristic of all human action. There is a fundamental sense in which reflexity is a defining characteristic of all human action. All human beings routinely keep in touch with the grounds of what they do as an integral element of doing it. What do we mean by keep in touch? It means that even as we do something, even as we act and do certain kind of things, we are aware about what we are doing, why we are doing and what is it that we wish to communicate or achieve. That is we are aware about every aspect of the action that we do. We keep in touch with the grounds of what they do as an integral element of doing it. Giddens calls it reflexive monitoring of action using the phrase to draw attention to the chronic character of the action involved. This is not the sense of reflexivity which is a specifically connected with modernity though it is necessary. In other words whichever societies we live in, traditional, modern, there is human beings not only act, human beings are very self-conscious, they are aware of what they do when they act. Remember in earlier uh, discussions when we discussed micro sociology we talked about meaningful action, the symbols, the signs, the messages that we emit when we do certain kind of act. When we act we are also aware about the grounds that 
what could be the consequences of these actions? What could be the dangers or limits of this action? We are both acting, thinking and reflecting human beings. But the point that Giddens is trying to make is that reflexivity is different in traditional and reflexivity is different in modern cultures. What is it that reflexivity is like in traditional cultures? In traditional cultures, the past is honored. Symbols are valued because they contain and perpetuate the experience of generation. Tradition is a mode of integrating the reflexive monitoring of action with the time space organization of the community. What does this mean? It means firstly that there is something very distinctive about traditional cultures that we give a lot of significance or importance to the past, to our honored symbols, to the values which were passed on from one generation to the other. The second is those values, those symbols are organized within the manner in which time and space of the community of traditional communities are organized. For example, rituals that in most traditional society there would be various kinds of rites of passage, birthing, uh, growing up, reaching adolescence, marriage, um, you know, nuptial, puberty rites, uh, various kinds of rites which mark the growing up, mark time, mark space in terms of how we organize our life and reflexivity here is therefore in a certain sense limited or defined by the way traditional society is organized. What changes? In traditional society it is a mean of handling time and space past and present and structured by recurrent, Re recurrent meaning repeatedly certain kinds of social practices are performed. You get up in the morning, uh, you may be doing the Surya Namaskar, you may be doing the morning prayers uh, depending upon the religious community you belong to, you may pour water on plants, you may wash your feet. There are certain kinds of practices which are repeated repeated until it becomes routinized. It in a fun fundamental sense structures the way we live our lives from the time we get up to how we eat, what times we eat, when we fast, when we do not fast, when we break our fast. There is a certain kind of repetitiveness through which this is done. And the other part of reflexivity in tradition is that many of these traditional cultures were also oral cultures. Not all, uh, many ancient societies were not oral, but at some point of time all of our cultures were oral. Now in oral cultures, uh, very importantly Giddens says, tradition is not known as such even though these cultures are most traditional of all. And you may ask, how is that? How is it that in traditional societies people do not talk so much about tradition? It's in modernity that we start talking about tradition and we say, oh this is our tradition, this is today I'm going to wear my traditional dress, today I'm going to make my traditional food. Whereas in a traditional society you don't say that today I'm going to dress up traditionally or cook food traditionally. You live like that every day, every day of the year. You do not think of tradition as a discrete entity which is invoked at certain points of time or for specific occasions. So here tradition in fact in traditional societies is not quite understood in the fashion tradition is understood in modern societies. And Giddens argument is that writing had a very important role to play uh, in the manner in which tradition became differentiated from the natural calendar of life or the natural time space organization of a community. He argues writing expands the level of time space distanciation. Writing expands the level of time space distanciation creates a perspective of past, present, future in which the reflexive appropriation of knowledge can be set off from designated tradition. What he is saying is that it is only when we start writing that the past is frozen in a certain sense of the time then it is not something which is recurring through our actual practice, but which is 
contextual, which acquires a certain distance from our everyday life and we can appropriate it at a particular point of time, but it does not, is not as central and pervasive as tradition is in traditional culture. In pre-modern civilization, reflexivity is largely limited to interpreting and clarifying tradition. For example, many of the debates in traditional society is how would a particular text be read. As you would know, a lot of theological discussions in every religion is interpretative that did the text mean this or did the text mean something else. And But it is within the limits of that tradition. The past weighs heavily on the present and the future. The other aspect of writing in traditional culture is the literacy is only uh, you know, experienced or is a monopoly of the few. The routinization of daily life remains bound up with the tradition in the old sense. So here we have an oral culture, which may be a simple society, undifferentiated, where everybody roughly lives the same way, and tradition is built in their everyday life and practices. Then we have a kind of differentiated society, where you may have classes or castes, uh, but they're traditional societies, but writing has come and writing has made it possible for tradition to be in a certain sense frozen in the text which could be debated, interpreted, reinterpreted or invoked at a particular point of time. But for a large section of the people who are not literate uh, and that is how most traditional societies were divided and hierarchical, uh, tradition remained in the routines of everyday life. You know, should we use the left hand, should we use the right hand, uh, should we bow here or not, who should we touch first, whose feet should we touch first, what should we do. It is built in to the routinization of life. What changes with reflexivity and modernity? With the advent of modernity, reflexivity takes on a different character. And here I would like to spend a little bit of time to reiterate some of the discussions that we've had on modernity. We've talked in many earlier classes on basics of sociology uh, about the classical thinkers and how they talked about capitalism, how they talked about democracy, how they talked about science and critical thinking, and how you had an industrial society and how that transformed uh, the division of labor in society and made it more complex. So institutions of a particular order were very, very important in modern societies. Along with the institutions, you had new ideas of equality, liberty, fraternity, inquiry, a scientific temper of interrogation. Those were features of modernity. Along with all that, Giddens is saying that reflexivity takes a very, very specific character in modernity. And what is this nature of reflexivity? The reflexivity of modern social life consists in the fact that social practices are constantly examined and reformed in the light of incoming information about those very practices, thus constitutively altering their character. It may appear a little complex, but if you reread it and think about what it means, it means that in modern societies, we have much greater exposure to knowledge. We are much more aware about developments around. Uh, we, of course, the internet is relatively new, but today, for example, in contemporary society, uh, you are not feeling well and you've got a headache and you decide to Google headache and you have hundreds of websites to which you could refer and when you read it and somebody says that perhaps uh, you know you should eat light at the light at night or you may drink this kind of water you decide to follow that so knowledge in a certain sense redefines our practices all the time we not only reflect on the textual correctness or incorrectness of the interpretation. We not only uh, just reinterpret or perform uh, practices which are there because they have been traditional and built into our everyday lives, but we gain fresh knowledge and our social practices are constantly examined. We will develop this point a little further as we go about and all cultures and here Giddens makes a quick clarification that in all cultures, social practices are routinely altered in the light of ongoing discoveries which feed into them. 
But it's only in the era of modernity that the revision of convention is radicalized to all aspects of life, including technological intervention into the material world. So you can have a debate uh, whether uh, using a mobile telephone uh, for long stretches of time is good for your health or bad for your health. You would be aware about radiation and what you should avoid or what you should not avoid. You are in a certain sense constantly revising what you do or correcting what you do or modifying your social practices with the kind of knowledge that is constantly coming and it is not only with reference to technologies and material world and some people argue that modernity is marked by an appetite for the new and here Giddens says no he doesn't quite agree that yes there is an appetite for the new in modernity but he says that perhaps this is not completely accurate and he says what is characteristic of modernity is not an embracing of the new for its own sake but the presumption of wholesale reflexivity which of course including reflection upon the nature of reflection itself. It may appear to you that he's going round and round. He really isn't. What he's trying to say that there's something very distinctive about the way we live our lives and consciousness in modern times. We are constantly reflecting upon our act. We are saying, uh, would it be all right uh, to greet somebody from another culture in this fashion? For example, in our countries, um, when the Western uh, uh, you know, person comes and visits, to, uh, visits India or meets an Indian uh, or an Indian woman in particular, they may have been told the knowledge that is there to them that maybe you're not supposed to shake her hand and uh, you're supposed to greet her in a particular fashion. Now what is happening, the knowledge that she or he receives is incorporated in order to prepare for greeting somebody from another culture and this reflexivity is a con and then they say and maybe the Indian woman decides to shake his hand or shake her hand and they say okay did I get it wrong so you're constantly reflecting not only on your act but even on the nature of reflection itself you are thinking is this the right way to live our lives is this the wrong way to live our lives it's interesting that in contemporary times so many people are constantly googling therapies you know or they go to spiritual gurus or they go to do crash courses in Buddhism and they try and have these little one-liners to say maybe this is the way one should live his life maybe this is not the right way and maybe that is the right way whereas in a traditional societies people just live their lives there was nothing uh, which was very very specific about how you lived your lives uh, you lived your lives because uh, the knowledge that you had, the practices that were there were part and integrally interlinked in the way you lived your lives. We now come to another aspect. We've talked about modernity and reflexivity. We've talked about the nature of traditional societies and how writing alters reflexivity. We've also talked about how in a modern society, reflexivity becomes a defining feature of people's lives, you know. And now we come to a little different kind of aspect following from the argument that Giddens has been building up, the relationship between social sciences and reflexivity. What is the relationship between social sciences and reflexivity? All the social sciences participate in reflexive relation, although he argues sociology has a very central place in it. And then he gives a very, very interesting example. And before I enter into those examples, uh, maybe a little divergence about the relationship between natural science and social science. Many of you who do social sciences and have a discussion on the unity of the scientific method proceed with a certain understanding of what science is. So the question of verifiability, the question of validation, the question of experimentation, the question of predictability, are they empirical testing, retesting, certain kind of, um, so to say, uh, words, uh, modes by which science is practiced. But most importantly, um, there is this whole feeling that social sciences is just not good enough, not good enough as natural sciences. 
And indeed, natural sciences have made amazing, extraordinary um, you know, achievements and in, uh, inventions. The fact that I do not even know who I am talking to across time and space, maybe not just in India, maybe across the world, uh, is something absolutely phenomenal at the same time, at simultaneous uh, uh, time. You know. That is an extraordinary achievement which social science cannot do, but natural science can. Social sciences discoveries are never of the dramatic kind that natural sciences are. But social sciences discoveries are more tricky. They are more tricky because once they are discovered, so to say, they become routinized and part of our everyday life and we do not ever any longer recognize them as an invention. And I like to explain what uh, Giddens means by it and what I am trying to say. For example, economics as a social science had certain concepts which it developed. Concepts like capital, concepts like investment, market, industry and many others in their modern senses were elaborated as part of the early development of economics as a distinct discipline in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Uh, remember, they were concepts, they were terms, terminologies which had very, very specific meaning, had very specific methods by which you could calculate or conceptualize them and they were emerged with the early development of economics as a discipline in the 18th and early 19th centuries. To that extent, you could say they are social science discoveries. Take the discourse of economic, capital, investment, market, industry and many others which were developed in the 18th and early 19th centuries. But what happened to them? They became part of life. They didn't stand apart like rockets or computers or aeroplanes or the incredible other uh, new discoveries, the smartphones, um, the Google. Uh, you know, the various kinds of inventions which have been possible from natural science. The concepts of social sciences, which are discoveries of social sciences or achievements of social sciences become part of life. What do we mean by that? These concepts and empirical conclusions linked to them are formulated in order to analyze changes involved in the emergence of modern institutions. But they could not and did not remain separated from the activities and events to which they are related. What do we mean by that? What we mean by that is you have these concepts. You have these concepts of market, investment, industry, capital. In our everyday life today, even as we sit around our breakfast table or chat around the television, people would say market down here, market has gone down. And maybe this is not the right time to buy property. Uh, you know, uh, they may go and say that you know there is a shutdown of industry, uh, labor is in crisis, uh, there is no foreign investment coming, there is capital fleeing. Okay, now these are actually terminologies and analysis from the social sciences, but they have become part and parcel of everyday life. They have become part and parcel of the reflexive consciousness of people as people practice, take decisions. They take decisions by reflecting upon these concepts of capital, investment, market, industry. They take life changing decisions. Should I decide to change my job now or not? Should I decide to leave my job now or not? Should I withdraw the money now or not? Should I invest in mutual funds or not? Has agriculture become an unproductive possibility or not? Now all that information, empirical as well as conceptual, is emerging from the social sciences. But they have now become part of everyday life. They are now part and parcel of human life. So you cannot see them as the discoveries. Similarly, in political sciences, look at 
democracy. Look at the question of democratic politics, maybe voting patterns, maybe electoral results. And you would notice that how discoveries of political science are then built into the way people live. So people say maybe the idea of, uh, uh, you know, uh, voting groups or, uh, you know, what they say, a uh, particular kind of, uh, uh, you know, associations uh, which are there or voting pattern or what they call maybe a shift in electoral performances uh, or lobbies uh, would be all linked to coming out from political science analysis, but becoming part of the reflexive action, not just of politicians, but even citizens, that even citizens would say, this is perhaps the right time to make this demand, because the government is perhaps willing to listen to us. Uh, maybe as citizens, we should do this. How, where did they get this concept of citizenship? Citizenship is a concept which is very modern, but it emerges from theories of political liberalism, debates between liberalism and socialism about substantive democracy, formalist democracy, etc. But over a period of time, through the media, through the academia, through certain kinds of discussions, it becomes part and parcel of life. Concepts, therefore, become part of life. These concepts and empirical institutions are formulated to understand changes and the emergence of modern institutions, but they could not and do not remain separated from the activities and events to which they are related. They become part and parcel of our everyday life. We have already discussed the various issues of economics and capital investment markets and industry. And we also realize that modernity and reflexivity have a very, very, very uh, close relationship here, here. Now, we talked about economics and we talked about certain kind of concepts of uh, political science and how the lay bang, uh, lay person, the lay woman and the lay person uses that knowledge to take social actions of what to do and what not to do. Like should we keep our money in a savings bank account or should we decide to make a short term investment in a flexible fixed deposit? You know, how do we get that knowledge? Where does this knowledge coming from? How does it become part of the apparatus of reflexivity that we have? They constitute what that behavior is, in, is and informs the reasons for which it is undertaken. Concepts such as these that we have discussed and the theories and the empirical information linked to them are therefore not just handy devices whereby agendas are more clearly able to understand their behavior than they could do otherwise. They reconstitute our lives. They change the way we live and inform the reasons for which it is undertaken. Now, where does sociology come in? We've talked about social sciences. We first talked about modernity and reflexivity. Then we talked about social sciences and reflexivity with examples from economics and political science. And now we are going to look at sociology and the reflexivity of modernity. The pivotal position of sociology in the reflexivity of modernity comes from its role as the most generalized type of reflections upon modern societies. The official statistics published by governments concerning, for instance, population, marriage and divorce, crime and delinquency and forth seem to provide a means of studying social life with precision. We'll uh, sort of spend a little bit of time by what exactly is Giddens trying to say here. He says that, look, yes, economics gets reflexively built into our lives, so does political science. But he says that sociology has a very, very special role as the most generalized type of reflections. And he gives a very simple example. As you're familiar, that sociologists uh, are very often involved in the production of statistics sometimes official statistics and sometimes statistics perhaps by other agencies other than the offices, the official statistics. What kind of statistics do these uh, you know, official bodies 
produce, gather, collect, tabulate. The official statistics published by governments concerning, for instance, population, marriage, divorce, crime, delinquency and forth seems to provide a means of studying social life with precision. Now, there are two ways of looking at sociology or at social sciences. One way of looking at social sciences is that it's just like natural sciences. Uh, we have to have hard data, we have to quantify and only if we have hard data and we can quantify, we can be precise in our analysis and our prediction. And this is uh, a kind of perspective uh, which uh, Giddens called the naturalist perspective, the naturalist understanding of society. And he uh, alludes to Durkheim as some one of those who would perhaps uh, agree about the whole question of a naturalistic perspective. But the point that Giddens is trying to say that these data that you collect, they could be precise, they could be useful in order to govern a society or to make policies, they could be useful even for people who are engaged in social movements. But the point about reflexivity that Giddens is making is a little different. He is saying that the lay person, you and me, the ordinary person who living their everyday life are also impacted by these new empirical data. They are also impacted by the data on population, marriage, divorce, crime, delinquency. And I will give you examples of the same. For example, take the question of population. Globally, for example, in Western societies, uh, they are, there is often a certain panic among certain sections in Western societies that perhaps uh, the population of those countries are changing and there will be increasingly the presence of non-white people in those societies and therefore there would be a population change and there would be a threat to the cultural identities of those societies. Similar kind of fears are often expressed in South Asian societies of, of even regions within South Asian societies that the change, the demographic shifts in the population would lead to certain threats to cultural identity of people who would be considered uh, earlier migrants or indigenous or native, whatever the term may be, to those societies. So you would have various contending data being produced available on the internet and population studies in fact then become part and parcel of everybody's common sense or ideas with which they live and they decide to take certain kind of actions according to the perceived notion of population shifts or population reshuffling or threats to cultural identity. Likewise marriage and divorce. Uh, like people would be uh, very aware about data on marriage and data on divorce, uh, that people are marrying much later in life. Women uh, very often take a deci decision to marry only when they are settled at their workplace and that may take a much longer time. So they decide, they plan according. Then they would also be familiar with comparative data saying, look, this is the average age now. Likewise with divorce, people are much more aware about divorce rates. They are much more aware about crime and delinquency. So parents bringing up their children are often anguished that would there be child tempted by crime. Uh, they hear about internet crime, they hear about computers and the internet being used for pornography. Uh, there is a great sense of anxiety and they reflect upon it. So they reflexively modify. So when they go and decide to perhaps buy a particular app in order a child lock for certain kinds of websites on the internet or on television uh, programs or tele television channels, they are reflexively monitoring their action. Now contrast this with the kind of reflexivity that we saw uh, being discussed by Giddens when he was talking about traditional society. In traditional society, you do reflect, but you basically reflect within the parameters of custom, tradition, everyday culture, everyday practices. Here even tradition becomes a reflexive uh, form or idea that you look in. Like I said, let us be traditional today. Today it is ethnic wear. Tomorrow it is traditional um, you know, wedding and day after it is some other kind of wedding. Here 
tradition is invoked as a matter of choice. And choice, as you're aware, is a very modern term. Choice is not something which traditional societies were either blessed or not blessed with. Choice is something very fundamental to modern societies. The idea of individual rights, the idea of individual choices, that we take a call, we decide what we wish to do and when we wish to do it, etc. So here the sociology and the reflexivity of modernity is a fascinating point. Now going back to the whole idea of the relationship between natural science and social science, all of you are very familiar with the fact that uh, natural science had a huge role uh, for the advent of modernity. Natural sciences transformed the world, transformed social life. Modernity was a different kind of place because of natural sciences. Now social sciences too modified the modern world but in a far more complicated fashion. It's not that you just had a refrigerator that you could now use, which is out there, outside you. It does modify your life and life practices, but you can see refrigerator as a discrete, distinct entity, which would have been invented, modified, marketed, produced by A, B, C, D. We can't say the same. Who invented capital? or who invented investment, or who invented the category of the market. But what is important in the social sciences is that once invented, they not only analyze, but that analysis is then learnt, accepted by the lay person, and the lay person then acts depending upon how that knowledge has been appropriated. This difference between natural science and social science makes the whole issue of the manner in which discoveries or concepts travel in the social world as distinct from the natural world very, very different. I'll come back to this whole issue of natural science and social sciences a little later. But for now, let's go back to official statistics and state power. And we look at official statistics that you know the census, you have various kinds like we used to have the planning commission, now you have the Niti Aayog. You have various kinds of state organizations who assemble official statistics. And this assembling is itself a reflexive endeavor permeated by the very finding of the social sciences that have utilized them. Uh, many um, you know, months ago, in one of my uh, discussions here, uh, I was talking about the way uh, the development of gender studies and a fallout of the second phase of the women's movement in India meant interrogation of existing census data and recognition that women's labor were not being counted because women's work was not being counted and work was being counted from a very male perspective and from an organized sector perspective whereas most women worked in informal sector, unorganized sector and very often within the domestic environments and they decided therefore to redefine work and recognize a lot of work which women did but which were not counted. Here you have an example of official statistics collection itself being a reflexive endeavor that they think about it, they reflect, they get new, further new information from social movements, from the academia, from the media and that itself is incorporated, modified, harnessed, honed and into their processes. A reflexivity data and life choices. Let's go to something like marriage, you know. We of course talk about marriage being made in heaven, marriage being a very personal choice, marriage being very individual. Indeed it is, all of it. But at the same time, the argument that Giddens is talking about in reflexivity is not irrelevant here. That is very much relevant here. How is it relevant? Take the knowledge of the high rate of marriage might affect the very decision to marry as well as decisions about related considerations, provisions about property and so forth. Awareness of levels of divorce is normally much more than just consciousness of a brute fact. Take this example, uh, some of you would be aware that nowadays very often people take a decision before they get married that suppose they get divorced they're going to split their property in this fashion or their savings in their fashion. 
Now, here is a situation where the awareness about the chances and possibilities of divorce being higher, people are taking a decision to even plan their divorce at a time when they're entering or even before entering marriage. How far more reflexivity can modernity get? How sociologized can marriage and family get? For example, when we think about marriage and we think of family, we think of them as natural concepts which are part and parcel of our lives. They're personal choices, they're special, they're sacred. But what happens with modernity is not only do people start calculating with the knowledge that they have, but we could use the word that the very terms marriage and family, the very institutions of marriage and family get sociologized or sociologized. And I read out, virtually everyone contemplating marriage has some idea of how family institutions have been changing. Changes in relative social position of men and women, alteration in sexual mores, all of which enter into processes of further which they reflexively inform. Marriage in the family would not be what they are today were they not thoroughly sociologized and psychologized. What do we mean by this? The point that Giddens is trying to say is that everyone, virtually everyone who are thinking of getting married nowadays is aware about how family institutions have changed, how there is the change of gender relationship between men and women, uh, sexual mores have changed and all these decisions have entered into processes which will they reflexively digest, think about, monitor and then they act. So, in a certain sense, we can say they have been thoroughly sociologized or psychologized. They may go to a counselor before they get married. Uh, they may take decisions of how they do. Uh, as somebody who occasionally or not maybe more regularly watch uh, soaps on television, uh, on Indian television, and I'm very surprised often to see how natural it is for people to marry and remarry. Uh, whereas maybe 40 years back for my generation, it was not something which was routinely possible. You didn't have a situation where uh, every second or third person that there is a possibility of a marriage breaking down or remarriage for that matter. And you see this knowledge and information feeding into the kind of scripts which scriptwriters for soaps do because it's perhaps accepted. It is seen as normal, it is seen as something which is natural, not something which is going to shock the mores of society. So this is the point uh, which is being made about marriage and family getting sociologized or psychologized. Questions about women and women's desire to work and be autonomous and take a call on their own. You see it everywhere. We've had recent marriages of very high profile celebrities and I was looking in the social media and there's so much discussion about marriages, so much discussion about weddings, so much discussions about questions of small, you know, close family, in, uh, you know, intimate family, questions of uh, friends uh, that perhaps even the idea of friends therefore get sociologized. Even the idea of how a wedding ought to be uh, gets sociologized. You know, people start thinking, discussing, reflecting, monitoring, and taking a call upon it in that fashion. How concepts circulate in and out. The discourse of sociology and the concepts, theories, and findings of the other social sciences continually circulate in and out of what it is that they are about. In doing so, they reflexively restructure their subject matter, which itself has learned to think sociologically. Now, just before I sort of slowly draw to an end of my uh, lecture, I want to spend a few minutes on what do we mean by concepts circulating in and out of our social life. New concepts come and they circulate it in and out. You know. For example, uh, there are so many words uh, which now form part of our everyday language, like concepts like closure, concepts like moving on, uh, various concepts which were not there before. They may have emerged in everyday life, they may have emerged in the academia, 
but they come in and out, they move in and they start circulating. Uh, you know, maybe it would be interesting for you, those of you who are, uh, you know, in various Indian languages, uh, what are the English words that you use? And here I sort of would like to uh, repeatedly apologize for not being able uh, to give my lectures in Hindi, but I, I am something I am trying still to see if anything could be possible in that regard. But to coming back to the point that perhaps in many Indian languages, there are so many English words uh, which we use constantly uh, in our everyday life. Say at an earlier point of time when people felt that you should never break a marriage, whatever may happen, the word adjust. Adjust has almost become an Indian word nowadays that you know you sort of slightly adjust or slightly accommodate and they reflect a particular social context. At another point of time you say uh, you have concepts like uh, you know which young people use have a life, take a call you know which are far more individualistic in its orientation. Uh, so, the fact that you have the idea of individuality, the idea of autonomy or the idea of making choices of your own which may be, may have emerged within social science disciplines, may have emerged in sociology or political science or economics, take the concept of choice. Choice is a concept which emerges very integrally linked with the question of economics, free market economics, the concept of being able to make a choice. Uh, very integrally linked with political philosophy, the ability to make a choice, who do you wish to vote or not vote, what kind of life do you want to lead or not lead, uh, can you take a decision to be educated or not educated, how much choice is self propelled or how do structures impinge upon the limits of your choice debated in enormously in um, you know, political philosophy, choice as socially constructed, what are the structures in society which limit. And so a lot of sociologists at one point of time would argue that sociologists deal not so much with choice but with constraint, that how limited are we in our decisions, how much can we act and how much we cannot act freely. The idea of freedom, the idea of liberty, the idea of constraint, the idea of choice, they emerged in the social sciences. They emerged in the social sciences because the theorists of social science were trying to understand what was changing the structures of modern societies and they came across with these categories and once they came with those categories, those categories circulated into society and became part of everyday life and reflexively monitored the way we conduct our lives and there would be some times when they circulate out that some other terms come in and replace those earlier words uh, which were there at one point of time. It is in this context that Giddon says modernity is itself deeply and intrinsically sociological, that modernity is itself sociologically uh, you know because modernity cannot be understood without reflexivity and without reflexivity you cannot understand sociology. Now we come to the trickiest part of the story that does more knowledge mean more control. So, in natural science if they know exactly how to control their experiment, the chances of predictability are greater that they would know exactly which temperature the machine should be kept, what should be added, what should not be added, what should be monitored, uh, how experiments should be conducted. There is more knowledge and more control. But in social sciences, Giddens argues this can never happen. And why does, uh, can it not happen? He says that more knowledge about social life equals greater control over our fate is false. It is arguably true about the physical world, but not about the universe of social world. And why does he say it? And here he gives four sets of factors and I end with a reference to each of these four factors. First factor is differential power, that all of us do not have access to the same knowledge. Uh, like for example, I noticed in contemporary societies in India, people ha who are more well off, well to do, well informed, uh, they are more likely to be more careful about medication. Uh, they are more aware that they could have a problem of antibiotic resistance and they are very careful about avoiding it except if absolutely necessary. But people who do not have access to this kind of knowledge 
uh, would go with the assumption that medicines are like magic and they're going to cure and there's nothing like any other consequences which could happen. The second is values and the question about if you have greater knowledge, can you control greater or do values, uh, can values be controlled at all or values are shifting and he says there is no such rational base of values and shifts in outlook cannot be controlled. And the third is unintended consequences. You plan something, but something else happens. And one of the favorite examples that I often had that people, maybe many reformers in the 19th century wanted women's education so they could be better mothers and wives. But once women got educated, they became better mothers and wives, but very often they also became uh, very, very uh, committed to their own jobs and uh, you know, uh, development. And finally, the four, that once you have this new knowledge, that knowledge changes the dynamics of society, changes social actions. And therefore, what you decided to study initially gets transformed. Unlike the natural sciences, therefore, the intervention of an observer changes what is being studied. This may have appeared to be a little complicated, but it is an entry to understand why the sociology and the social sciences are integral to modernity and why the discoveries of the social sciences become part and parcel of social life. Thank you very much.